Welcome back to the our morning section. The next, the next talk is from Francis Brown. The yeah, oh, uh, yeah, <laughs> title, <laughs> some title. Hypergeometric functions, cohomology with coefficients and Galois. Coefficients. Yep, the title is hypergeometric functions, cohomology with coefficients and Galois coactions. First of all, thank you very much for the invitation. It's wonderful to come to this, this beautiful city and, and participate in this, this great workshop. Um, I'm afraid I'm not going to say anything new compared to what I said at Amplitude in Dublin if you were there. So um, I put my apologies if you already heard a similar talk. But I may say some, some small remarks that may be of interest to some of the mathematicians um, and, and also some of the physicists. Um, so, may, so this conference is really about um, uh, cohomology with coefficients and hypergeometric functions and intersection numbers. But before talking about that, I'd like to step back a bit and discuss classical <coughs> period integrals without any exponents, without any coefficients. So um, a period integral um, is typically the integral of some algebraic uh, differential form over some chain where uh, some chain contained in some algebraic variety defined by a system of polynomial equations. Okay? And um, I guess now it, it's, it's uh, very well accepted by everybody that there is um, value in interpreting <coughs> such numbers as cohomology or via cohomology. So we think of the differential form um, rather as a cohomology class sitting in some vector space, which is finite dimensional, and we think of the chain of integration as um, defining a homology class in some Betty or simplicial homology. That's because by Stokes' theorem, the integral only depends on these <coughs> classes. Okay, so we've, we've seen this many times in this conference. Um, there are variants. You can, you can put parameters in your integral. You can make omega depend on, on some variables, and that means we're taking uh, our variety x over some base for mathematicians. What else can we do? We can also consider cases where the integral has a boundary, and that means, uh, so the boundary will be, will be contained in some, um, some <coughs> sub-variety, um, and for that, you need to replace cohomology with relative cohomology. So you can forget this in a first approximation, but it's needed for the examples. Okay, so well, this is really slow. I'm going to use the computer. Okay, the main example um, in this conference are, are Feynman integrals. So um, here's an example of a Feynman graph. Represents some particles coming in with some momenta. They interact in some way. And to this graph, you assign uh, a number, which is very approximately, because we've seen this many times already. It's, um, and in somebody else's notations, I can't remember who. Um, these are not my usual notations. Um, you get an integral of, with some, some explicit prefactors, which I'm going to ignore, over some domain, in parametric form, from zero to infinity, of something which is clearly algebraic. It's um, some explicit polynomials in some variables, some integration variables, and the momenta and, and particle masses. So it's an integral which depends on parameters. So it's exactly a, a period integral in the classical sense. So p here, later, p here is going to be an integer for now. But later on, it won't be. OK, so um, what can you do with this? So first of all, and it got me, the result which got me interested in this subject was this paper of Bloch, Inno, and Kreimer in the case where there are no masses and momenta. Um, and you can generalize this uh, in, 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 the, in the most general case as well. And that's that Feynman integrals are periods of, or can be interpreted in, as cohomology, um, uh, of a certain algebraic variety relative to another one. And I, I'm not going to explain what that involves, because it's not the, the point of this, of, of this talk. But it involves some resolution of singularities. You really have to do something. Um, but we can interpret the Feynman integral as something cohomological. OK, but my point here is that this is not the only way to do it. 
This uses the parametric representation, but as we were discussing last night, you could use momentum representation. Um, in um, That would give some very interesting information about Feynman integrals as well. Um, in Sebastian's talk, he, he uh, had a, a, a version with coefficients with a slightly different setup. Um, um, Simon also had uh, yet another proposal for interpreting Feynman integrals as periods of cohomology. So this is a, th a theme we've seen very much throughout this conference. Okay, so wh wh why do we care? What do we gain from interpreting an integral as a cohomology, as a period of some cohomology? So well, we gain the full arsenal of several hundred years of research in algebraic geometry. We get canonical differential equations, so-called picard fuchs equations. We get Deligne's theory of weights. Um, we can speak about weights of, 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 of periods. Um, this is a very deep and subtle theory. Um, we also get the action of a group called the mativic galois group, which acts on all these uh, integrals. We get a whole lot of, of extra structures that I don't think we have even started to scratch the surface of the possible applications to, um, to, to the, in, in, the, in the physics context. For example, so um, Johan has mentioned these, these differential equations. I think you can, I'm trying to find very nice bases to express these differential equations. I believe by using these structures, one can do uh, an awful lot in that direction. It's just not been done. Okay, so I think we agree that there's a, a, a there's some gain to be had from interpreting cohomology, uh, periods as cohomology. Okay, so the correction I'm going to talk about, I'm going to be very brief, but um, what we can do then is, is, is promote um, these integrals with the numbers into something a bit more rich, where you take your, your cohomology, Durand cohomology, Betty homology, and these are vector spaces, you remember that data, and you record the defining data of the integral the class of the differential form and the class of the domain of integration. Okay, and then what you get for this is you get um, uh, what's called a co-action, and I don't want to go into the full theory here because it's, it's kind of technical, but the co-action is something magical. It's an operation which takes this jazzed up version of the integral, it's just got a little superscript M, and it takes it and it breaks it into a tensor product of simpler pieces. So the way to think of this is, is um, such a, a period integral is something like a molecule. It's very complicated, but it's built out of simpler atoms, simpler building blocks. And its co-action takes this very complicated molecule and it breaks it into these nice simple pieces so you can describe it and, and study it. So this right-hand side of the co-action knows everything you possibly need to know about uh, periods. It's extraordinary that it, it respects all the possible algebraic relations between periods. It respects all the ordinary differential equations. It respects all the monodromies of your integrals. It's very surprising that there exists anything non-trivial that respects all these structures. It's very surprising indeed. So if you've never seen it before, one, one way in which I can explain this is that if you're interested in an integral like um, uh, log x, we can think of this just as a number or a function, but it's the point of view um, of metallic periods would be to say, let's not, let's not think of this as, as just a number. Let's think of it in the period matrix in which it occurs, which is this. So it gets promoted. So we start with a number, but we replace it with a matrix. And instead of just remembering a single entry of the matrix, we remember the whole matrix plus the data of which entry we're interested in. And this contains a lot more information. OK, so now let's move to core module coefficients. So today, what I want to talk about are integrals of this form. So we have an integral of some uh, algebraic differential form multiplied by some polynomials raised to some powers. So all the hypergeometric functions we've seen are of this type. We integrate over some cycle. The key point here is that I want to think of this as a function of the variables SR1 up to SR, and that's the key point. I want to think of it as a function of the SIs, not as for values of the SIs. So if, mathematically, what this means is that we take an algebraic variety and we consider a bunch of maps, a bunch of morphisms, to GM. 
So all this is on joint work and joint work in progress with the people mentioned here. The motivation for these integrals comes from the theory of hypergeometric functions, but also string theory and dimensional regularization. So, here, so maybe this is the, the sort of only point of my talk that, that's, that's, that's particularly um, noteworthy. And that's that there are, there are two completely different points of view on these integrals. Um, and we tend to gloss over this as if there was no issue, but there's a major issue. There's the global point of view, or what I want to call global, which is where these parameters are complex numbers and they have to be generic. So generic typically means they're not integers or, or linear combinations are not integers. But they're fixed. So right in the theory of cohomology coefficients, the SI are fixed. But in physics and in many other applications, we don't want to do that. We want to do a Taylor expansion or Laurent expansion in the SIs. And if they're fixed, you can't do that. And furthermore, you want to do a Laurent expansion precisely at the point that, you have, that you're not allowed to consider in the first setting. You want to do it at precisely the most non-generic point. Okay, so the, I'm going to call this the global point of view and call this the local point of view. And then I chalk and cheese. So, um, what's happening with the global perspective? Okay, let's... So, what we, we've got this integral and we take the SIs to be fixed and generic. Um, and as uh, has been explained to us in... in in, in many talks so far through the work of, of Aomoto and Yoshida and Mimachi and all these wonderful talks have explained to us how you can interpret this as a period of cohomology with coefficients. So you take um, um, your, your algebraic var variety X, which is our, on which omega and, and gamma are defined, and we, the data of, of these functions will actually produce for you an algebraic vector bundle on X. It's actually going to be rank 1 in this case. And it comes with a connection, an integrable connection. And you can define the algebraic Duran cohomology of an algebraic variety with coefficients, with twisted coefficients. And this is a finite dimensional vector space. Um, and then uh, Betty homology is replaced with homology with coefficients in a local system which is related to the local system of, of, of um, flat sections of this um, algebraic vector bond. And there's a pairing, a period pairing, that enables you to integrate classes here against classes here, and that gives this integral. Now the point here is that these groups are finite rank, okay? So there are finitely many periods, finitely many num numbers you can get out. Okay, so that's global, so please remember this, this, this sort of terminology, global versus local. Okay, so local is, is very different. So now we're going to think of the parameters as formal parameters. S1 of S are complex numbers. And we want to do a Taylor expansion at a point, oh, I forgot to say, at, at a point where something goes wrong. So in, in the global picture, I forgot to mention, um, that the SI have to be generic. They're values of SI for which the, the rank, the dimension of these groups jumps. And typically you want to avoid that. Here we're going to do a Taylor expansion at precisely the point where the dimension, the ranks of these groups um, jumps. It's not, it's, it's non, it's not the, the, the generic one. So we can, we can Taylor expand very easily by replacing F to the S with writing that as exponential you know, f to the s equals x s log f, of course. And we can naively do a, a, a Taylor expansion under the integral, and we get something like this. But of course, this is not right, because in general, we have poles in the SIs, and we have to take care of that. Let's gloss over that for now. But then, so we get a, a, a power series with certain in values in certain integrals. Now, these integrals are, in fact, classical periods that I started with. They don't look like it, but I'll explain in a minute why they are. But they are periods of a completely different variety. They are periods of some very different algebraic varieties, which depend on the parameters. So we're getting, um, in this local picture, we're getting infinitely many periods. So in the global situation, we had finite rank groups, finitely many periods. Here we get a Taylor expansion with infinitely many different numbers, which are related to completely different geometry. 
So all I'm going to do in this talk today is, is illustrate all of this on a very simple example, which is just the beta function. Okay? And hopefully I will illustrate some things which are very well known to physicists. I apologize. But I think they may be of interest to mathematicians. You may not have seen them. So the toy example is the, the beta function. I've chosen to normalize it in, in this particular way for technical reasons. Um, and so as we know, the, the Euler beta function is a quotient of gamma functions. So let's think about this from the global point of view. That means that we take um, S0 and S1 as complex numbers, and generic here means that they're, they're not integers and their sum is not an integer. Here, the algebraic variety is, is the Riemann sphere minus three points. The vector bundle is just its, um, its uh, ring of regular functions. And the connection on it is, um, is d plus s0 dx over x plus s1 dx over 1 minus x. Okay? This has logarithmic singularities at 0, 1, and infinity. So um, that's, that's our vector bundle with connection. And then we, have, um, we can look at, um, we can define a corresponding rank 1 local system over the field to which you adjoin e to 2 pi i s0 and e to 2 pi i s1, which is spanned by this multi-valued function. Okay, and that defines a local system of rank 1. So um, here we have the Duran cohomology is very easy to compute. It's, it's one-dimensional. It's spanned by this differential form. And it's rank 1 over this field, the field Q adjoined s0 and s1. Okay, that's a subfield of the complex numbers. Um, here, we, we, to, for, for, to make life simpler, we can use the locally finite homology in this case. Um, we don't have to. Um, but it's just easier to write down this class in that case. And it is given by the interval from 0 to 1, uh, twisted with this, um, this section of this local system. Okay. And it's single-valued on... on this function is single valued on the interval 0, 1. So then this is, this is rank 1, so we get a 1 by 1 period matrix where we integrate all of these guys and pair them with all of these guys. There's only one of each, so we integrate this differential form against this cycle and we get an interpretation for the beta function as the sole entry in a 1 by 1 period matrix. All right, so that's a matrix with one entry in it. Okay, so we, we know this extremely well. Let's look at the local point of view. So now we want to expand around the bad point, S0, S1 equals 0. That's the point that was ruled out in the previous global picture. So we do this, we take these um, uh, exponential terms here, x to the s, and expand them as, um, infinite, uh, as an infinite sum of these powers of logarithms. So I'm, I'm brushing something under the carpet here. There are poles, there's some divergences. So um, one has to regularize some of these integrals, but let's not worry about that. Okay, so how do we, how do we interpret these coefficients? So they're, they're, there's some nice numbers. We want to think of them as periods. So how do we do that? Well, the idea is to replace the logarithm, which is not algebraic. We write the logarithm as an integral of um, a logarithmic one form, dv over v. Okay, so then we can, we can plug in, replace all the logarithms with integrals of differential forms. And what we get, so if you do that, um, if, if, I, if we, you plug in the logs into, into the right hand, into this expression here, right? Log to the k0 and log 1 minus x to the k1. And you plug in this, this rule, what you, the, that previous expression ends up some, being some big integral of this bunch of one forms, du1 over 1 minus u1 dot dot dot. The dx over 1 minus x, which is the same um, which is the, the same guy here, it hasn't changed, not, not touched this term. And then, and then you want to replace these guys with, with integrals of one forms and you get a whole sequence of, of other one forms. And now the domain is, is this complicated thing here. So we've interpreted the coefficients in the expansion as periods. But notice this has got nothing to do with P1 minus 3 points, or it doesn't, it doesn't appear to in an obvious way. So what, what are these periods of? Well, actually, they are. They are. So these are clearly classical periods uh, in the sense I mentioned at the very beginning. But they're periods on a completely different space. They're actually periods on the moduli space M0n of 
curves of genus zero with Anmark points. You can also think of them as, as iterated integrals on the space we started with. So they're not periods, they're something a bit more subtle. And these, if you compute these numbers, you get something slightly tricky. You get multiple zeta values, um, which are quite complicated, right? They're not single zetas or anything. They're, they're complicated multiple zeta values, if you work out what this is. So um, that's a bit of a puzzle. But we know, for a very classical result, that the, that, the, that the periods of the global thing are the same as the periods of the local thing, because a, a function at a point is determined by its is, is, is given by its Taylor expansion. Um, and so a very, very classical result, I don't even know who this is due to, but uh, extremely old, that the, that the beta function can be written miraculously as an exponential in, um, in some numbers, which are, in fact, just the Riemann zeta function. And that is not at all obvious uh, from this integral representation. Here we've got some very complicated multiple zeta values. But by some miracle, it turns out that the beta function is just an exponential. Okay. So we've got we've got a, a, a period of, of a cohomology of a rank one system is actually an infinite sequence of periods on a completely different set of algebraic varieties. Okay. So the goal then, what, what is what is the purpose of this whole theme? Is to check that certain natural constructions agree on the local and global sides. So the local picture and the global picture are completely different mathematics. Um, what we want to check is that um, constructions actually pass from one side to the other. That's completely not, not obvious because they are, as I've tried to explain, completely different geometrically. So I'm going to emphasize two, two such um, constructions, single value periods and collections. So single value periods um, in the case of the beta function. So this is something I, I, um, I didn't know this complex beta function until recently. It's not very well known to mathematicians. It's this complex version of the beta function, which we saw in Pierre van Hove's talk this morning. And there are three ways to compute this complex beta function from the classical beta function. The first is, is a corollary of a very general theory on single value periods. And I like to call this the double copy formula because it's the completely general formula that holds for all algebraic varieties. And, that and the recipe is you take the inverse conjugate of the period matrix and multiply it by the period matrix. So when you take the in, the, remember the period matrix was just the beta function, so that means you've got to divide by a beta function. So that's a very natural formula which generalizes. Um, if you apply the twisted period relations that we've heard about earlier on, you get what the physicists call um, the KLT relation, which relates the complex beta function to the square of the classical beta function, and you get all these um, signs in there, which, as we know, can be interpreted as Betty intersection numbers. But the point here is the double copy here has nothing to do with intersection pairings. It's got nothing to do with that. It's valid even in the absence of an intersection pairing. This is the formula which generalizes. It's only when you apply the twisted period relations that you get this formula, which does not generalize. Okay? So this is very well known in physics. It's called KLT, Kai Luel and Tai, and goes back many years. This one, however, I don't know what it's called. So please, would the physicists tell me um, what, 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 what this is called and what, what its physical meaning is? I'd be very interested to know. Um, how, so uh, I'm going to go quickly here because Pierre already explained all of this. If we do the local, the, we Taylor expand this complex beta function, we get something extraordinary. We get exactly the same expansion, except what's happened is that all the odd zeta values are multiplied by two, and all the even zeta values have simply been thrown away. So there are three different recipes from getting this this weird complex beta function out of something that we think is much simpler. Okay, co-actions. So, um, again, I haven't explained much of this background on, on this co-action, but the, the co-action, roughly speaking, is when you have a period matrix, is that you can approximately sort of, you know, break it into, break the matrix into pieces, and the co-action really takes minors tensor, you know, sub-matrices tensor other sub-matrices in the period matrix. 
That's how the correction works. So if we had a one-by-one one period matrix, in this case the beta function, there's nothing you can do. I mean, the only reasonable correction formula is to take beta to beta tensor beta. It's the only thing that, that makes sense. And the question is, does this actually, is this actually a reasonable formula? There is no theory of motives of such uh, objects. Um, is this complete garbage? Or does it actually do something? So if we were to um, pass to the local picture and see what this gives, that means we expand out this beta function in terms of the motivic periods associated to zeta values. So you can make sense of this. Then you check that this correction formula is equivalent to a very, simpler formula, is a very simple formula on the correction on the values of the Riemann zeta function. You can ignore these superscripts m and dr for now. It's not just a technicality. And it turns out that, that this formula um, is in fact true. And um, something I proved in 2011, it's quite hard to show. It's, 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 it's non-trivial. So this very simple argument, very naive argument with the beta function produces something that's actually quite hard. And what's the proof? Well, um, it's very easy. Um, those of you who know Hopf algebras will already see the proof. Um, if, if you have um, delta of alpha is alpha tensor 1 plus 1 tensor alpha, so that's this equation, that means that alpha is primitive, then because a, a co-product is always multiplicative, as Ruth explained, um, delta of alpha to the n is alpha tensor 1 plus 1 to the alpha to the n, by the binomial formula, this equation is equivalent to the exponential satisfying this equation. So, um, so everything lines up which is kind of extraordinary because there's, there's no reason for it to do so. So the theorem um, um, we proved with, with, with Clément Dupont earlier this year was inspired by the work of, of um, uh, Abreu, uh, Brito, Du, and Gardi. So I have to think about the alphabetical order um, in my head. It's difficult. Um, and where, where they proposed some, some co-action formally um, found experimentally by expanding to very low orders in, in, in the parameters and, and, and trying to, to, to fit them together into a coaction formula that, that makes sense in the local setting. And I, I, because there's no reason to, to connect these global and local pictures, I very much wanted to check whether um, one could prove any cases of this. Um, so what we did is we, we, we checked all of this for the Laricella hypergeometric functions. So in particular, the, the Gauss hypergeometric function, F21, um, which is a very classical function, um, has these, these weird new properties. It has a correction, and it has a single value correction in particular. OK, so let's see what the Laricella function is. We take um, um, P1, the Riemann sphere, minus um, a bunch of points. So I'm going to call the first point sigma 0. I'm going to fix it to 0. And the other one, sigma 1, sigma 2, up to sigma n, can be free to move around. Okay? Then the Laricella function is an, a, a hypergeometric type integral of this form. You integrate from the point um, sigma 0, 0 here, to one of the other singularities. So we integrate along you know, any path between these singular points of. Um, this um, logarithmic one form, which has poles at the sigma i's, and this product of, of linear, linear terms to the power of some parameter sk. Okay. Now, what I've done here is I've, I've normalized things in a, in a careful way, and I've packaged all these Laricella functions into a matrix. So this is a matrix whose ijth entry is the, the index i tells you which path you're taking, so there are lots of possible paths from 0 to 1, 0 to 2, 0 to 3. So you have all these possible paths, and you have all these possible differential forms you can stick in. That's the columns of the matrix. Great. I'm nearly finished, actually. Um, so these are, this is the matrix of Laricella functions, and they are multi-valued functions of these um, points sigma 1 up to sigma n. So in the case where sigma just consists of 2.0 and 1, the uh, Laricella function is just exactly the beta integral um, we studied a little bit earlier. Okay? So we get back the, the Euler beta function. 
The next most interesting case where we have four punctures, <coughs> including infinity, is essentially the Gauss hypergeometric function. So um, you can write the Gauss hypergeometric function here with three parameters a, b, c, of a variable y. If you multiply by a beta function, which is of the same in the same family, so that doesn't frighten us, then you get a, a exactly Laricella type integral of the type described above. Okay. So here, um, when we think of this hypergeometric function, we're normally thinking of a, b, and c as fixed numbers, and y is moving. Okay. So we need to remember that that these functions. So our cello functions are, are, are functions of these, these points sigma i. Sigma i can move around. There can be any configuration of points on the Riemann sphere. Um, OK, so uh, the theorem is that everything I mentioned for the beta function works verbatim for the Lauer cello function. The only, issue, the, only subtleties are, um, the only subtleties are these poles. So you've got divergences in these integrals. And in the local and the global picture, you've got to regularize in such a way that the regularizations line up. Um, and that's, uh, that, that's the only tricky part. OK, so let's look at this single value business. What do we get? So um, this general um, machine of periods tells us that we should be considering a single valued Lauer-Cello function, which is this, this integral here. So it's the same definition, except x to the s becomes val absolute value of z to the, to the 2s naught. Everything, everything gets replaced with its, its absolute value. The domain of integration is, is changed. It becomes goes from being a dz to a dz dz bar integral. So it's a, 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 an integral of twice the dimension. And the domain now is over the entire Riemann sphere. So what's happened is the path of integration has been gobbled up somehow in this, in this differential form. So we get a matrix of um, an, an n by n matrix of these functions. And I claim that they're single valued as functions of the sigma i's. It's not obvious, but well, maybe it is obvious. Um, certainly well, certainly when, when, when the integral converges, which are these conditions here. OK, so there's a double copy formula. This follows immediately from a very general theory of single value periods. Um, it's pretty much the definition of the single value period. So the double copy is you take the matrix, this, um, the, the, the period matrix. So this is the matrix of Laricella, of all Laricella integrals, inverse complex conjugate. And you multiply it by the matrix of the um, the, the classical Laricella integral. So these are holomorphic, these anti-holomorphic. Why is they anti-holomorphic? Because the sigma bar here means that you change all the singularities sigma i into sigma i bar. So as a function of the sigma i's, it's really a function of the sigma i bars, which are anti-holomorphic. So that's the general double copy formula. So Pierre um, talked a lot about this this morning. It's this uh, holomorphic, anti-holomorphic factorization. And it's very reminiscent of the formula we saw in uh, Yoshida's talk. He defined his Schwartz map. At some point, um, he had matrix and, and the Hermitian and the uh, transpose conjugate. Um, so so there, there, are, there, are, there are similar things. Um, similar things will be familiar to the experts in hypergeometric functions. But I think that this, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this single valued Already in the case of F21, the single-valued hypergeometric function is not something very well known to mathematicians. Um, the only reference I could find in the literature was the paper of Dotsenko and Fadeyev in the 60s, where they considered a very special case um, to solve a problem in conformal field theory, as Pierre mentioned this morning. Cool. Thank you. Um, so coactions. So what does the coaction formula look like on this Lauer-Cello functions? Uh, the formula is incredibly simple. In fact, it couldn't be any simpler. The coaction of the matrix is the matrix tensored with itself, essentially. So um, in Ruth's talk, she mentioned this this joint work in which they had some conjectural formulae for a whole range of coactions on hypergeometric functions, much more general than this. Um, we didn't check. We didn't check that that this. Um, is equivalent to their formula. 
I mean, the, the setup's slightly different. But um, th this is this is um, proven um, in 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 a, in a using some Tanakian category theory, and and the, the statement is that when you Taylor expand or Lahar expand in all the sigma i's, this exactly matches with the co-action you get term by term with the expansion, which is very surprising. That was inspired by their, their conjectures. There's no reason why a mathematician would consider such a formula because it's bonkers. There's no reason for it to be true. And that's why this why I did this work because I didn't believe didn't believe this at first. Um, so what's what's the idea of the proof? Um, there's some so the only issues are, are te technicalities using tangential base points. You've got to be very careful. You've got to renormalize these um, integrals in, in twisted cohomology. They have poles. You've got to remove all this poles and deal with the poles and the SIs, but we know how to do that. And then the only technical um, idea is, is an idea that goes back to Drinfeld, where you look at um, what's called the Drinfeld associator, so, um, so it's the solution, the transport of the kinetic Zamologikov equation for physicists. Um, for mathematicians, it's the, gener the non-commutative generating series of multiple zeta values. And if you take what's called the metabelian quotient of that, you actually get the, re the, the classical Euler beta function. So this was proven by Drinfeld in his, his very, very famous paper um, in the 1990. So he knew that when he defined his Drinfeld associate that he related it to the beta function. Um, turns out you can generalize that, and, um, and that's, that's what enables you to compute the coaction. So th this is a completely separate theme, and I think it's worth developing, that these hypergeometric integrals are, are related to metabelian quotients of <coughs> fundamental groups of varieties. So that's a whole direction of research that I think would be interesting to pursue as well. So that's, uh, that's the end of my talk. I hope I didn't... Thank you for the nice talk. Any questions? Uh, thank you for this beautiful account. You, you made life very simple by telling me I didn't have to bother about what you mean, what you meant by Durham on the right. Yeah, that's correct. Never. <laughs> oh, you do, you do very much so. Oh, the, talk, uh, yeah, the talk uh, is, uh, because of time limitations, I decided mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. not to mention these things. But I can explain, so um, if you want me to. Yes, please. Uh, so metodic periods, maybe this audience might not find it so um, so alarming. The material period consists of, of um, some object M. So M typically is a, well, you can think of this as a, um, a, a pair of vector spaces. Let's just take the Durham, algebraic Durham cohomology of a variety. It's a Q vector space. Um, it consists of the Betty cohomology and a comparison isomorphism, which is um, the, the integration pairing between the two. So integration pairing can be written for Langrothendieck in this. So this is differential forms go to functions on chains. Okay. And in a, a differential form gives you a map which to chains assigns an integral. So that's a nice model. So this is the data that you start over. This is completely algebraic. It's a ve two vector spaces and uh, um, a linear map between their complexification. Then you take a, um, a class, omega, in the first vector space, and you take the chain of integration, and you take some equivalence, equivalence relations, very simple equivalence yes. relations. And that's clearly a version of the integral because this always has what's called the period map, which gives you back the integral from it. Yes. Okay. So what's a Duran period? The drum period um, um, is it, something very similar. So you take the same object, but now instead of a different, uh, instead of a, a chain of integration gamma, you give yourself another differential form. So omega is in H n Duran, and nu is now a dual differential form. And it's the same equivalence relation. So you've replaced integrals over chains with integrals against differential forms. And now this might not alarm this audience because we've been talking about intersection pairings. 
And intersection pairing is precisely a way to pair um, um, differential forms with their duals. So it's, it's exactly a map on Durand periods. That's what the intersection pairing is. So that's the Durand period. I'll stop there. I could, I could talk for hours about this. But I'll stop. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the, the integral that you have uh, considered in the um, Lauricella type, they are uh, um, um, one-fold uh, integrals. Right? Yes. Um, uh, would it be interesting to extend it to multifold integral, or is it known? Is it trivial? No, no. Uh, to extend what? To, uh, to to another type of functions that uh, can be integrated over. Uh, to to extend which, which, which what, what question? <coughs> Um, uh, can you go back to oh, this yeah, slide yeah, to the definition? Just this, um, so the, the easy uh, No, no, I, I meant the, the, the Lauricella. Oh, yeah. Yes. Lauricella. Yes. Said, uh, Sorry. Yeah, here. This is integrated just over one uh, variable x, yeah. right? Um, would it be interesting to have a more integration variable uh, formula? Um, sure. So, so th this is the joint work that I, I, I wasn't. I, I tried to avoid talking about um, with with um, Tapuskovic, Frezan, and, and Dupont. And the next stage after this is to consider just a completely general mm -hmm. uh, f1 to the s1. Of any algebraic variety. So the, 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 the props of this, of this piece of work was a sort of piece of principle to have some examples where things work, and then, then you establish belief that yeah. a theory exists, and the next stage for us is going to be to do the general case. So that, and that would contain... Um, um, <coughs> so the, the subtlety here is, is the divergence. So yes, the, the, what would be interesting in the higher dimensional cases is, 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 that is to understand all these di divergences, and that's the tricky part. Okay, thanks. Any further questions? If not, let's thank the speaker again. <laughs> <laughs>